Hello and welcome to SpyCast from the secret files of the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. I'm Dr. Vince Houghton, the museum's historian and curator, and today we're talking baseball. I am standing outside the center field gate of Nationals Ballpark, the home of the 2014 National League East champion Washington Nationals. Now, baseball has been played professionally in the United States since the mid-19th century. And since the very beginning, teams have been looking for ways to gain a competitive edge over their rivals. In many cases, this involves stealing signs, the information passed from catchers to pitchers, or from managers or coaches to players. What this really turns out to be is a signals intelligence exercise. Coaches, managers, players are finding ways to encrypt this information so that the other team doesn't know what you're doing. And at the same time, the other team is trying to find ways to decrypt this information so they know what's about to happen. As part of the International Spy Museum's effort to show you how the principles of intelligence are now being applied to almost every aspect of everyday life, I sat down with a former CIA analyst who's now using that training he learned from the agency to study the statistics and history of baseball. We spoke about spycraft being applied to the game of baseball, and in particular, the story of the 1951 Giants, who set the standard for spying in baseball. My guest today is Brian Soderholm DeFatti, who spent more than three decades as an intelligence analyst for the Central Intelligence Agency and for the National Counterterrorism Center. He spent time working with counter-narcotics for the CIA, he worked in the Inspector General's office for CIA, and he finished his career as a senior analyst for the National Counterterrorism Center, where he wrote analysts intended for senior policymakers under pressure oftentimes to provide insight and analysis on fast-breaking events. Since he retired in 2012 from intelligence analysis, he has taken these skills that he learned with the CIA and applied them to the study of baseball. Brian is a member of the Society for American Baseball Research, better wise known as SABRE, uh, Sabre is an organization that wasn't very well known until relatively recently when Michael Lewis wrote a book called Moneyball, which talked about the ideas behind Sabre metrics. A lot of what Brian has done in his study of intelligence in baseball can be found uh, through uh, his blog called Baseball Historical Insight, as well as his website, which is thebestbaseballteams.com. He is a frequent contributor to Sabre's journal, the Baseball Research Journal. He's also a contributor to a book that Sabre published in 2013 about the 1964 Philadelphia Phillies. And finally, he is a frequent presenter at the Annual Society for American Baseball Research Conferences, in which in 2012, he gave a talk about the 1951 New York Giants team that we will be discussing today. Welcome to the International Spy Museum, Brian. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So I'd like to start our discussion with a basic conversation about intelligence analysis at the most general level. You're an analyst for 33 years, working counterterrorism, working counter-narcotics, and a lot of times people don't understand what analysts do. Uh, it doesn't get all the best press. Most of the time it's the collections guys that get all the movies and get all the press, the spies that are out there getting information, but without analysis, intelligence doesn't work. Even when people think about analysis, sometimes they think, well, You've got these guys sitting in Langley in some dark corner with a bunch of raw data in front of them, and you know, the ideas just come to them. They have epiphanies. But in reality, it's real work. There's a real process involved in intelligence analysis. Principles, can you talk a little bit about what you did as an intelligence analyst? Well, first of all, I think that intelligence analysis has become even more complex and complicated in more recent years, um, beginning really with the advent of things like CNN, and obviously that has escal escalated to an absolutely tremendous degree with social media and all the other outlets that people get information these days. So the challenge for the intelligence analyst is essentially to be able to tell senior policymakers something about the issues they're covering, whether it is about a terrorist group or terrorist threats or what Russia may be trying to do next in the Ukraine, whatever the issue is, something that is different and more insightful from what they can read in the New York Times and other right. newspapers. Because one thing to keep in mind, newspapers like the New York Times 
the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, they've got first-rate journalists. And they're very often very much on top of their game. And um, among the first things that policymakers will do in the morning is take a look at the newspaper to see what's there. The intelligence analyst brings to bear on the problem not only very unique information that isn't available uh, to news outlets, including from technical collection sources, uh, but also vast knowledge and understanding of the regions they're covering, mm. of the individuals they're covering, and the challenge is really to bring this to a way that helps a policymaker think about the, how to think about the problems that they're dealing with. And your, your regional foundation was South Asia for a lot of the time that you were in the intelligence agencies. What, what, without saying anything you can't say, uh, South Asia, was that the Indian subcontinent? Is that Afghanistan? Is, is that what we're talking about? Uh, it's actually Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. Uh, I guess I had the interesting experience of breaking in to the intelligence business right at the time that the Soviets invaded Afghanistan and almost immediately was thrown into uh, the Afghan task force at the time. So that was a real sort of baptism by fire um, for me. And it's been great ever since. And what, what counter narcotics that that plays a significant role in that area of the world as well with the kind of money that's being raised by certain organizations that we don't particularly like with uh, opium trade and other things through Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, that's correct and an important point there is that transnational issues such as narcotics trafficking um, or international crime issues uh, increase significantly in proportion uh, when you had the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s, which was in fact when I went uh, to first the Counter Narcotics Center and then it became the uh, Crime and Narcotics Center. And uh, obviously a very significant part of that is the extent to which these illicit criminal activities, including drug trafficking, help to uh, perhaps fund bad guys right. like international terrorist organizations. When you were talking about what analysts do, you actually mentioned several different, to me as a diplomatic historian, kinds of potential enemies. You talked about the Russians in Ukraine, you talked about terrorism. When you talk about intelligence analysis, is there a difference in the way you look at a state actor, like a country like Russia, and what you did to a degree like counter-narcotics, counter-terrorism, non-state actors? Is there a different way you approach an analysis problem? Well, with regard to things like counter-narcotics and um, counter-terrorism, a very significant part of what we're doing is taking a look at networks and connections that tend to be transnational. Um, for example, drug trafficking, taking a look at you know, what's going on in the producing regions, how is this stuff being produced, how is it being transported from producing re regions to the United States and to other markets, uh, and then, of course, the, the trade-off as it occurs here um, in the United States. Uh, when one is taking a look at foreign governments, which you're also taking a look at for things like counter-narcotics and mm -hmm. counter-terrorism in terms of what policies are they pursuing, there you're, of course, much more focused on um, what challenges do they face, uh, how do they perceive the threat. Um, with regard to the challenges that they faced, you know, are they because of economic limitations, uh, personnel limitations, uh, you know, resource gener uh, limitations in general? Is there the political will to uh, go and do the necessary things to uh, reduce the threat, particularly from our perspective as to how it might in impact on the United States? A as busy as you must have been, particularly in the last several years before you retired, how did you have the time to research baseball on top of all this, the type of intelligence analysis you had to do for CIA and for the Counterterrorism Center? Well, I don't know whether you could call this one of the great things about working for the intelligence community or not, but you really can't take your work home with you. Obviously, you're thinking about it. And it's also a very high-stress um, occupation. And I've always had a love for baseball, and so my way of sort of winding down was basically to um, get into the study of baseball. One of the things I've always been most interested in, and the thing that makes, to me, baseball such a great game, is really its history. Right. And so I've really delved into that. And with the advent of sabermetrics, really beginning with Bell, Bill James, mm -hmm. starting in the late 70s and the early 1980s, there are ways to start looking at issues beyond just the rudimentary statistics that 
you grow up being familiar right. with, such as home runs, runs batted in, batting average, earned run average, wins, losses, and that sort of thing. For, for those out there uh, of our audience who, who don't have the baseball prospectus on their shelf at home, don't know the name Bill James, uh, I don't know some of these young guns of GMs in baseball like the Theo Epsteins and the Paul DeBodestas. Um, sabermetrics, to a degree, revolutionized the way that uh, people viewed baseball. It took away the idea of uh, kind of a scout sizing up a player and saying they had good bones or they had a good face and kind of using gut instinct to determine whether a player was worthwhile or not to a very math-based, statistics-based analysis of these players. Um, was this something that you bought into right away? Was it something that you've, you had to be convinced of? I mean, both of us, we, we, we've grown up watching baseball from probably a very young age. And I fell in love with baseball not because of I could count stuff, but I've, you know, there's a lot of what people and probably people in your field cringe when you talk about things like intangibles. Um, is this something that it took a while for you to buy into? Or as, as an intelligence ana analyst already, did you just look at sabermetric and go, that makes perfect sense? I think one of the qu things with regard to intelligence analysis is you really want to try to understand what's sort of going on influencing situations. And so it's not only merely asking kind of like the obvious questions. And the, the newspapers do great on kind of getting at the obvious questions. It's sort of trying to understand your second and third order questions. Well, as in, you know, well, why is that important? And then if you answer that, to even go beyond that to say, well, what is affecting that? Mm -hmm. Or why might that even be important? Or what might the implication of this be? The wonderful thing about sabermetrics is, for the first time, it really allowed me, at least, and presumably very many other researchers in the saber community and elsewhere, to start asking those kinds of questions. Right. Um, that's really interesting. How did this guy really compare relative to somebody who was maybe on a better team and had a much better record right. uh, on an individual basis that he couldn't take advantage of because he was on the losing Chicago Cubs in the 1950s or something? It is, is saber and sabermetrics a a response to the ability to collect better information about statistics? Is, is there a reason that sabermetrics becomes uh, a thing at the time when baseball statistics had become much easier to follow? What I'm, what I'm asking is, did you need Bill James for sabermetrics, or did you need the ability to use computers to collect information? Was it a collection that led to the ability to analyze, or was it just a happenstance that you had these types of people like Bill James and others who are around at the right time of history? I think I would sort of talk about it in terms of it almost being like a mutually reinforcing cycle. Um, you had really brilliant thinkers, many of whom were mathematicians, who also now had suddenly the ability to computerize records and consequently to be able to sort things through algorithms to try to figure out different aspects. So they were finally able to use computing power to kind of answer questions that they may have been long able to ask, but you couldn't quite identify how to get at it because you just simply really didn't have the data. So you, you did, I mean, you, you really married the two things that I've been dreaming of marrying for most of my adult life is my two things I love more than anything, baseball and intelligence. Um, and you don't have to go far to read stories about spying in baseball. Um, there, there's a story from this year about the, uh, there's a pitcher for the Braves who had an impeccable credential a month or two into the season, went down to play against the Miami Marlins in Marlins Stadium and got lit up for eight runs. And immediately, Freddie Gonzalez, the manager of the Braves said, oh, they, they, must be, they must be stealing signs. They must have something, someone out in the horrendously ugly home run sculpture in the outfield in Miami with binoculars or something stealing signs. And, and so it's not, you don't have to go far to hear people talking about this. And there's a long history of spying in baseball, of using intelligence in baseball. In a general sense, what, what different ways can managers, players, executives use 
to use some of the same intelligence concepts that we see in the world of espionage, in the world of baseball? Well, I guess one thing to keep in mind is that baseball may be a game, but it's also an industry and a very, very serious business. And so consequently, you know, winning really matters. And teams will want to have every possible advantage they can exploit to be able to eke out victories. And so knowing in any given situation what the other team might be intending to do um, on offense, you know, whether, for example, um, they want to hit and run or maybe do a suicide squeeze, you know, whatever the play might be, or on the defensive side, what pitches might be thrown, mm -hmm. um, where to position the players is critically important. There's also the aspect with regard to that that everybody knows this. So for as long as the game has been played professionally, teams have used signs. And one of the reasons for using signs is so that it's not intuitively obvious to the other team what you're going to do, but also very important is so that everybody is on the same page. So for right. example, if there's a hit and run play, the batter at the plate knows that he's going to have to swing at the pitch, right. even if it's one he may not like. On the other hand, if it's a straight steal, even if it's a pitch he would love to dearly, dearly love to hit, he's going to let the runner go for the, uh, uh, for the stolen base. Right. The interchange between the pitcher and catcher is very, very important because pitchers have any number of different sorts of pitches they can throw, fastballs, breaking pitches, off-speed pitches. And if the pitcher and the catcher aren't on the same page, you could have uh, unintendedly negative consequences, right. such as a passed ball. Well, I, signs, whether it's a third base coach or if it's a catcher, I mean, this is, these are communications. And, and, and really what you're doing when you're doing multiple signs, I mean, even a casual fan of baseball has seen the third base coach going through a series of signs. Uh, this is really communication security. I mean, this is ComSec. This is an encryption of a communication from the third base coach to the runner, to the hitter. When there is a man on second, the catcher goes through a series of signs, doesn't just put down a one because it's very easy for the man on second to relay this to the, to the batter. Uh, again, encryption. I mean, the same thing you would talk about if you're making codes for sending battlefield information or anything else. Um, and so stealing those signs and breaking those, it's really, when we're talking about cryptography in this case, is, and people have taken the time to try to figure out in, in what these actual sequence of signs are. I mean, that, that's been part of baseball for decades. It's throughout history. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, it's very interesting that some very marginal major league players have basically made a career in the major leagues by virtue of their unique talent to be able to identify and interpret opposing team signs. Uh, two in particular I might mention here because they would mm -hmm. figure it in 1951 were um, Charlie Dressen and uh, Herman Franks, both of whom were marginal major leaguers who had extended major league careers uh, based often on their ability to read opposing players' signs, which also, by the way, since they both became managers, helped them to better understand the nuances of the game as well, um, which contributed them to them becoming managers. It, speaking of man, I mean, that's a really great point that you brought up about this idea about managers, because when we talk about intelligence, that last stage of whether we're going to call it the intelligence cycle or anything else is getting information to a policymaker, to, to your consumer, as people in the business talk about, you know, whether it's a president or a military commander. In this case, the manager or the GM is the con ultimate consumer of this kind of intelligence. I, do they play that same role as a policymaker in an intelligence outside of baseball operation where the information they're getting or they're using to make these kinds of decisions? Or is it, is, is it not analogous? Is there a close enough analogy to make that point? that the manager or the GM is really the intelligence consumer in this case? He certainly is in, in, in both regards, but so too are the players themselves. Okay. You know, for example, if you have uh, um, a runner on second base who's able to pick off the catcher's signs and a batter at the plate who wants to know what pitch may be coming, and not everybody does, by the way, you know, if he does, then that batter is himself an intelligence consumer 
you know, being signaled by the guy at, you know, the base runner at second base who's tipping him off as to what the pitch might be or where the location of the pitch might be. Yeah, I and mean, that location is almost uh, as easy as it gets, too. I mean, that's very, you see catchers move. I mean, my uh, friends and family who don't know baseball as well uh, have constantly asked me, why is a catcher bouncing around behind the plate? Why do they wait till the very last minute? Because location of a pitch can be just as important as knowing what pitch is coming. And it's very easy for a man on second to tip off a batter about location. Um, that, that's, I mean, fascinating to really talk about the analogies between these. What about tendencies? Does that go outside of the realm of a traditional intelligence gathering where you're really getting into the weeds of analytics, uh, talking about this pitcher tends to throw this pitch on a certain count, or this hitter doesn't hit well when you throw him inside? Um, are those things that we can say are, are, are that information, is that something that's analogous to the intelligence world? Uh, I would certainly say so. And it's become increasingly important now that you have ballparks completely wired up. And every single pitch and every single play is basically, you know, recorded uh, and also mapped out uh, allorigmatically, if, mm -hmm. that's, uh, if that's the word. So teams have now very detailed charts on every pl on what every player's tendencies is where he's going you know where he tends to hit the you know this pitch or where he tends to hit that pitch where his particular weaknesses might be uh, similarly with regard to pitchers one thing that's been very interesting in recent years and apparently has really taken off this year to an extent never before is the extent to which on infield defenses yes. you have yeah, uh, you know shifts in the infield such as you know three infielders on the right side of second base right. Uh, to account not just for the, the uh, you know, power hitters like the Ted Williams uh, of days gone by, mm -hmm. but even for other hitters who don't represent that much of a power threat simply because their tendency is always to hit the ball in a particular direction. There was a game a couple days ago where they put four infielders to the right of second base because the tendency of the hitter to always, a left-handed batter to always pull it, they understood from the analytics that that was going to be the tendency. Um, and I think it's, it's, does the trend, somewhat a, a question I think I know the answer to, but I'm really interested to know what you're going to say. Do you see this trend moving in a direction that this is going to continue and be even more so in the future? I guess my answer to that would be that to the extent that technology continues to improve and that you have really clever people able to, you know, develop Al algorithms, mm -hmm. um, any way to kind of computerize this information to f get any advantage you can, it will continue. Yeah, the, the of course, Moneyball, you know, sabermetrics introduced to, to the to the public was about the Oakland A's, about a small market team that had very little money, uh, trying to do the best that they could with uh, the, the limited resources to beat the teams like the Yankees and the Red Sox and other teams. Uh, now it's been embraced by everyone, where you've got huge market teams with almost unlimited bank accounts using these computer analytics. Um, almost like, you know, countries like the United States with unlimited resources using the most advanced analysis uh, versus an upstart country that's forced to use advanced stuff to kind of keep, keep track. Um, is there an end in sight? I mean, you, you hinted that there may not be, but is there an end? In, I mean, baseball tends to go in cycles. Yeah. Is there an end to this cycle, or do you see this continuing, you know, unchecked for quite some time? Where the Red Sox hired Bill James, uh, who was, you know, the, the real money ball guy, nuts and bolts, saber metrics, talk about how a small market team can win. Well, handing him, you know, $200 million payroll. I mean, the, the question always was, what if you gave Billy Bean $200 million, Billy Bean, the general manager of the Oakland A's, would he ever lose? Um, and that's really the, the experiment that the Red Sox did with Bill James and Theo Epstein for a time, um, and they won three World Series in a decade. I mean, is that, is that an indication to everyone else that this is here to stay and not going anywhere? I think it's here to stay and not going anywhere, but I also think that there's always going to be a tension between sort of like the traditional ways of scouts, 
you know, basically eyeballing a player mm -hmm. to see, you know, out what he's actually got on the field to play, how he comports himself, uh, and then the statistics. And you, one can argue that the, the, uh, the numbers don't lie. And my impression is that a lot of teams now, what they're trying to do is integrate the two approaches mm -hmm. so th that you're not overly heavy on, uh, certainly not on the uh, analytical side or more heavy on the analytical side than w might be warranted. One of the things that's really interesting to me, and I have no idea the extent to which Sabre metrics went into it, um, but the Oakland Athletics earlier this summer made a deal in which they gave up one of their best hitters, um, Cespedes, mm -hmm. a Cuban defector, sent him to the Boston Red Sox for a first-rate pitcher, uh, John Lester, because in the previous two seasons, they got bounced out of the playoffs basically with not enough pitching depth. Right. Depth. So they were preparing themselves for, since they were well in first place at that time, they were preparing themselves for the postseason by sacrificing a little bit of that hitting for even more pitching. The result has been, though, that their hitting has suffered dramatically since then, and now they're no longer even in first place, and they may, may even wind up having to fight for a playoff berth um, just to get into the postseason. Right, I, and Cespedes has been a hitting machine for the Red Sox since, and Lester's been decent, but certainly... Uh, the, the trade looks like it was a good trade for the Red Sox. Since we recorded this, the Oakland Athletics squeaked in the playoffs, one of the worst records of the playoff teams, and lost a first round series with the Kansas City Royals. The starting pitcher for Oakland that day, John Lester. <laughs>